Hi, I'm Robin Ginn, Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation. And you know, I get a lot of questions about the foundation. And most of the questions are about how awesome our projects are and how to get involved. But actually, another big question I always get all the time is, what is JavaScript mad about today? <laughs> now, you know, spoiler alert, um, we have what we call positive controversy at OpenJS, where people are surprised generally by how mostly positive and productive we are. But so I thought we would just sort of um, sit here with you all today and share a little bit more about how we make it work, building culture and community. So I'd love to start off with some introductions and your role at the foundation. Which way? Go, okay. Todd. Oh, okay, I'll start. Uh, Todd Moore. I chair the board of the OpenJS Foundation. Um, I was part of forming the Node.js Foundation as well as the JavaScript Foundation and then the merge of OpenJS coming together. So I've been with it since before it was anything and uh, enjoy working with everybody in JavaScript. It's been a lot of fun. Hi there, I am Liz Parody. I am from Colombia and my role in the foundation is I, I'm a community leader back in Latin America and I get involved in different events and decisions in the OpenJS world. I used to work for NodeSource as a head of developer relations but I just switched jobs like one week ago. Um, in Fusebit, I'm head of developer advocate there. And yes, I'm just basically very involved in communities, especially in Latin America. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm Sarah Chips. I'm an engineering manager at LinkedIn and also um, on the board of OpenJS as our, uh, one of our cross-project council representatives. Great. Thanks, everyone. So um, just starting off, just for some context about OpenJS. So Sarah, you represent the projects on our cross-project council. So just give us an idea on who, who is OpenJS, what projects um, make up OpenJS. Yeah, so on OpenJS we have a bunch of projects, some very large, some very small. Um, some of the ones that you may have heard of are you Node.js, AMP, um, jQuery, Dojo. Um, there's quite a bit, there's quite a few projects in different stages that are part of the OpenJS Foundation. Great, and Liz, at, when you were at NodeSource for all those years, I mean NodeSource is a member. Um, so tell me, why would somebody want to be a member of the OpenJS Foundation and sort of how, how is that different from what you're doing with the community? Well, basically, uh, communities and uh, companies get involved in communities because they want to give back and also because it's part of the business. Uh, for example, Node.js, if Node.js wouldn't exist, NodeSource wouldn't exist. So it makes sense for NodeSource to be part of the Node.js community. Um, but it goes both ways, like community benefits from NodeSource because, for example, NodeSource made the certification program for Node.js where 600 people have already certificated in Node.js. Um, and also NodeSource benefits from the community because it gives them visibility and, yeah, like a platform to get involved. So it goes both ways. Great. So, Todd, you talked a little bit about the Node.js Foundation and the JS Foundation coming together. So there was a merger a few years ago. So um, you and I sort of both go back a way. So tell us, why don't you take us back a little bit to the Node Foundation? And, you know, I heard there were some bumps along the way. Yeah, somebody said that. I, I you know, know, yeah. So, you know, communities, um, one thing we've seen throughout the years, and it's across many different projects, is communities get to a point where they look at the steward and they say, gee, we'd really like more say in what's going on. Gee, we'd really like to see things more transparent in the roadmap and what have you. And uh, so it got to that way in, in, in Node, uh, to the point of, of getting to a fork as well, too, with the project. And, and a lot of ill will happening between um, the, the members of, of the community and you know, um, at that time, Joyant was, was really the steward uh, over the project. And to their credit, they, they worked very hard to come together with the community to heal the fork, to create the foundation, and then to get people moving down a, a positive path, right? But that was, that was full of bumps. Like, you, you know, you have to admit it. it you know, it, it took a while to get trust to be built, right? Because once you lose that trust 
with the folks you're working with, getting it back is 10 times harder, right? So it took a while, but, but we were able to attract in other folks who really wanted to do good work. IBM stepped up, who I work for, right? And, and put a lot of people helping to get involved and get engaged, and you'll see that with Giuseppe and, and people like Michael Dawson and others who were there, and, and et cetera, James Snell, who was part of IBM at that time. Um, and, and it helped to smooth that over because we got to a level of stability. We figured something out. We figured out that you could have long-term stable releases and leading-edge things going on at the same time, and that you could then bring that into the stable release cycle that everybody was kind of looking for at a business level. And that's why people get attracted to the project at a corporate level, because now they can depend on it, right? And so this became the dependable thing that everybody could go and be part of. And once the community saw that, I think they felt a lot better about it. So we got through that growing pain kind of phase. And uh, you know, we looked around and said, gee, there's all these other JavaScript projects going on. We really need to sort of get our act together and, and be one. And, and so that sort of led to the JavaScript Foundation that, uh, that, that came together. And then um, you know, the, the Node community wasn't really ready to embrace that. So we had a you know, separate foundation going on. Um, but over time, again, trust built up. And once the trust was there, it became possible to then bring the communities together and have one organization that supports everything JavaScript. You know, it becomes the center of gravity that people can depend on. It's that neutral home that puts out stable, good stuff that's supported with great folks like yourselves who go out there and, and make sure that you know, people know about what we're doing, that the community is supported, the diversity activities happen, the things that we need to do to be a good community and operate in you know, a very open and, and fair way. So let's talk how, a little bit more concretely. How do you build trust? I know, Liz and Sarah, you've been involved in developer communities, Node.js, you've done .NET, many others. Can you just share some of your experiences on how you've built trust within developer communities? Yeah, sure. So trust is built in time. So basically, once you create the first event and people get to know you and your work and the type of speakers they're going and the dynamics of the event, um, once you have the first one, the second and the third one and the following events becomes easier. Um, so yeah, and once, as you said, like once trust is lost, I think it probably get lost forever because, for example, there is this event that happened a couple of years ago in, like, North Atlanta. Uh, a lot of its great speakers were invited and they were expecting 800 people, a lot of mo money, like, was moving around and at the end, two weeks before the event, it got canceled, everything. So people, I'm sure people will never trust this event again or the organizers or because this is, it was, like, a big thing. So yes, trust is built in time, and after you successfully have done a few events, that makes sense. I think, I think, I think that's right. I think it does really take time to build trust. I think, um, and uh, one thing that I've observed is uh, constant communication and transparency is really helpful. I think once. Um, when you're in front of a keyboard, when you have a keyboard in front of you and in between you and another person, it's really easy to forget that that person's a human being. So you can, especially um, in large communities, it can be really easy to use hyperbole or to get really angry at someone that isn't performing in a way that you want them to or isn't delivering something that you really need. And I think making sure to um, hear people, to communicate that you've heard them, um, and additionally, to be a little bit vulnerable is helpful too. I think sometimes um, reminding folks that um, where you are, you know, or you know why something can't be delivered or why something is late um, when you are falling short, because sometimes that happens. You know, communicating early and often I think is really helpful because when people know you and your project and the humans behind your project, um, it's a little easier to have empathy. So I, I also ping Giuseppe because I was going to be talking, and the one thing he was said we should stress is transparency really is is the key. And you know, as as we were going through the early difficult period, we made sure that transparency was just going on and everything that we possibly could, and tried to to foster that wherever possible. Right? Because if people know that they're involved and engaged, and they're they're seeing the decisions and they're working out publicly on it, it, it helped so much to to bring that trust together. 
And I will also say that trust is built if you feel safe and welcoming. So if you are in an environment where you feel that you can participate and be safe, that, that also helps with, with trust. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, that is huge. Um, yeah, I know on transparency at OpenJS, we live stream many of our meetings live on YouTube, and you can watch them. And um, I was at a JavaScript meetup last weekend, and they were saying, sometimes just turning on your camera, so it just helps make that connection. So um, we talked about sort of the, the human factor. There's a little process to build buildings communication um, in open source communities called open governance. Can you all explain what that is and how we do it at OpenJS? You looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So you know, when we, we set up the, uh, the foundation uh, in particular, what we were looking to do was make sure that the governing board was uh, its own separate entity that really wasn't in charge of the technical aspects of any of the projects, right? That the governing board was there to be supportive, to help them get charters in place, and to help them with the resources they need, like the computing resources and other things, and the marketing resources, or the, you know, um, funds, just travel funds, so that people could come to events like this, right? And uh, but to stay out of the workings of the projects, and then of course the projects have their own uh, little, uh, you know, I shouldn't say little, their own committees that, that run the projects. And then we have the CPC, which helps us with the sort of overall things that go across, across the teams. And it took us a while to get to that structure and, and make it effective, but it gives people a voice. And, and the other thing Joe wanted me to mention was, I'll keep going back to Joe, um, that <laughs> anybody can participate in the CPC from the community, right? And they, they encourage it. So, you know, it's a way of you being involved and helping to set the direction the tone and and support the organization so so that's kind of how we did it you know it, it was transparent um, the, the technology is not in any corporate sponsors hands it's not in the board's hands it's it's with the community members and, that, and that's what's really important yeah so basically like open governance is people that are inside the communities to govern to govern that community uh, for me, it makes total sense because these people that are already inside the community, they know the pain, the challenges, their desires, like the expectations so people can make better decisions. Uh, for example, and it makes total sense that it's people from inside the community. For example, if somebody, let's make like a real world example, if somebody from Seattle wants to be participated or involved in, in politics in Colombia, that would make a lot of sense in, unless this person has lived in the country for a long time. And yeah, so I think it's the same with open governance, like somebody from the inside, the making decision from that community, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think it's, a, um, to use the word again, is transparency is the big part. I think everything, that the org does, or 98% of the things that um, OpenJS does, it does in public. Um, and I find, or I found it was, it's very accessible and easy to get involved. So I think um, when we talk about open governance, that's what we're talking about. Right, yeah, and the CPC is the Cross Project Council, so it is the uh, kind of what other foundations may call the Technical Oversight Committee, we call the Cross Project Council, um, that works on common issues. Um, so, wow, that's a lot. So we're talking a very distributed way of, of governing open source projects. So, you know, if you're a company like NASA or Netflix or an organization and you're making a big bet on a technology like Node.js, like, how do you know that it's going to be there for the long term? How, you know, how can such this distributed way, how can a, a project prioritize like features and stability and security things like that and security and, and security, security. Yeah. <laughs> well uh, Nat NASA and Netflix were both node source customers and they were betting big in Node.js uh, so if this type of companies support Node.js in general they would make sure for example if there's a bug in Node.js that could potentially risk people's lives and also people's views on Netflix. So we don't want that to happen. So it's good for these type of companies to support open source projects. Um, Node.js like, runs in the most of 500 Fortune companies. So if something happens to Node.js, like pretty much the whole internet will 
die. 95% exactly. of the world uses some JavaScript in their sites. Yeah. yeah, so it is good for companies to support open source. Yeah, I think I hear a lot about, this is why foundations like OpenJS is great. We're all here just to shill OpenJS. <laughs> Sorry, we're all trapped. <laughs> Um, but I think there's other foundations too, obviously, um, and I think this is the benefit of having a lot of these. I think the open source model over the last 20 years has really changed a lot. I mean, I, I know a lot of us in this room will remember the days um, where companies refused to use open source, and then it was only tiny companies that would use open source, and then and now everyone's using open source. But I think the one thing that when I'm talking to folks at big companies that they factor in is um, longevity and support and I think that's why foundations uh, help so much is because when you have um, you know contributors running a project without that support um, it's really easy to get burnt out it's really easy to uh, you know people have very dimensional lives I think I was reading Twitter yesterday and I saw someone say that um, they are looking for folks to support their open source projects um, because they want to um, focus full time on their construction company, and that is fine, right? That's great. We all we're all humans, but in the, in cases like that, um, orgs are looking for what what is the fallback structure there, and do we have a foundation supporting them and people that will step in? And I think um, that's a lot of what folks at these large companies are looking for: is what's the longevity plan, and and um, you know. What, what is our risk factor yeah, here? And, and that's why you come to support organizations like we do. And, and you know, IBM sponsors a lot of organizations. I've set many of the ones up that are both here and in the Linux Foundation and other places as well. And, and it's because we're trying to establish that common de facto standard of code that everybody can depend on. And then you can build your business and your ecosystem on it and feel comfortable in doing so, that it's not in any one vendor's hand. They can't pull the license out from underneath you and swap it out for something else. And, and done with license like the Apache 2 license, you have a good commitment of both the copyright as well as the intellectual property for that individual contribution that you're making. So, so companies look at this and they say, wow, you know, this is, this is something I can depend on. And, and we've got all of these folks who have come together to go and put it together. Cloud Native Computing Foundation was very much that same kind of approach, right? There were competing projects out there all vying to become the project, right? Um, Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker Swarm. And we came together behind uh, Kubernetes because it, it looked like it had a, a very good chance and we could build consensus around bringing people to it. And then because it was in an open foundation and it was well sponsored and funded, it, it attracted others and you just watched it grow like a rocket ship to become now the thing when it comes to containerization and, and the infrastructure that we all can depend on that, you know, cloud communities will be building products around for a very long time to come, I think. And, and that's just, you know, it, it, it brings in those people and it makes that standard, it, it creates an opportunity for everybody. And you know, it's not necessarily whether you're going to make money on it, it could be that just because you enjoy the challenges and the problems, like I was saying in my keynote earlier today is, you know, there's good challenging problems out there that people just want to sink their teeth into and go work on. So here's the tools, go do it, do it together. I think what's cool to see, I think some folks may think that open source is very big company driven, big tech driven, cloud vendor, and obviously not the case. I mean, Liz, I mean, you're a great example. Um, Netflix, we have a new end user uh, board position and um, some end user activities in the foundation. So Netflix is on our board. Uh, NASA came, uh, they sent an astronaut to speak at our conference last year. <laughs> so that's all good. So, um, Okay, so here's another sort of question, or I don't know if it's controversy, people say, gee, Robin, some of your projects are kind of old. You know, how, how do you balance innovation like with the next hot new thing? So how would you, how would you all respond to that? jQuery is old, is that what you're saying? I respond <laughs> with, I love jQuery. <laughs> there, see, yes, there's no JS is old. <laughs> oh, no. But yeah, you know, and, but they're, they're highly used and they're highly visible and we depend on them, right? And that's why it's so important and to have a home like this to have that support structure because, yes, there's some projects that are, are older, but then there's things like uh, Node-RED, which is really cool and people use all over the world and, you know, it's not that old, right? So. 
Well, I would say that stability and innovation, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have both at the same time. Um, if you don't innovate, probably you, your project will left behind and will die. But if you're not stable, it can also become messy and disorganized and difficult for people to work. So I think both of them are really important. Talking about jQuery, um, I think people nowadays, they don't start projects and say, oh, let's use jQuery. No, I don't think that happened. A lot of people use jQuery because a lot of projects were built in that the particular technology, so people have to learn and adapt it. But in the future, if all projects don't adapt, they will be left behind. And we are in a very fast growing, speedy hunting tech world, software. And so if these companies don't move fast, they will probably die. So yeah, I think jQuery in the future is probably, maybe people will still use it because there's a lot of projects and migration could be very hard. But but yeah, I think most of the projects right now starts with newer technologies and technologies need to adapt. Great, yeah, we always say we don't pick winners or losers. We have projects in multiple categories as well. So, and people just have their favorite, we call it our, their favorite flavor of JavaScript, right? So. And they get supported through their life cycle. And that's, right. I think, the important yeah. part, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, what are the sort of tough questions do I get? Um, so, I, yeah, this foundation, I mean, why don't you just put your project on GitHub and call it a day? Like, why do you need this? <laughs> I think I always point out the fact that I think, um, and I think I'll be the first to say, because I learned this the hard way myself, that developers and software engineers are um, terrible salespeople. And um, <laughs> that's not all. I think, the, I think there's a lot of role. It turns out that... Um, what our dream is is that you put a project on GitHub and people are like, this is excellent software and therefore I'm going to be a part of it. This is wonderful. But it turns out like that is not the biggest part of it. Being excellent software is great, but also having good marketing, people being able to hear about your project, having good governance, all these different skill sets that aren't necessarily ones that come with building good software um, are really important. So I think um, that's one thing I, I learned getting involved in Open in JS and .NET Foundation and other foundations is I found that I really love the bureaucratic, bureaucratic part of open source um, because those roles are really important and it allows the core contributors to focus on the things that they love doing the most, which is writing code. Um, so I think the reason why that doesn't work is because there's so many other parts of owning a successful project that have nothing to do with what you're committing to a repository. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are multiple platforms for different needs. People communicate in different ways. So GitHub might be just not enough for for, for example, creating a community. There is a big community that works on Twitter, on Slack, on events, on conferences, on like projects like the OpenJS Foundation. So there is like different platforms so people can work efficiently. That's my thought. But it makes a great place to start, right? Yeah. And I think that's the important thing is you get something out there, you start to get interest, you see some stars growing, you see some forks happening. And, and then it, you, know, you cultivate those projects be, when they're really useful, and you hope to support them and, and see them grow into something that turns into a foundation on its own, even if it wanted to, or join one of the, the great things that happen. You know, there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of foundations to go around to put your things into as well, too. You know, there's not, not just us. No, there's lots of great foundations, yes. absolutely. Um, I'm, yeah. So um, another thing I sort of, you know, here is like, so I'm, I'm a company, I'm making a decision on what technologies to choose. Like, what, should I, what factors should come into play when I'm choosing a, an open source project to use? I, I'll start that one. So, you know, <laughs> license is one of the first ones we always go and look at, honestly, right? Because if it's not licensed in a way that we can generally make use of it, it becomes very difficult to want to get behind it, right? But then community activity, right? Is, is there really a robust community built behind it? Is there, um, or can it be built behind it? And, and with lots of diverse players, uh, you know, from individual contributors to corporations all working in it, you want to see a good, healthy community that's, that's vibrant and active and participating. 
And then you like to see ones who value diversity, who go on, even on their own and, and put in a code of conduct and, and start to think about how to behave and act together and, and foster those things. That's, that's the very first places that, that we start to, to look at it. And, um, you know, they've got to have good secure software practices as well, too. That's so important these days. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And also, um, I would say the maintainers, the contributors, and I will check when was the last commit, because if somebody made a last commit like two years ago, like, come on, don't, don't get into that project. Um, the community around it is very important. Um, yeah, the activity in general. Great. So, um, so another question I get is, you know, OpenJS Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation, as you know. We are independent, but they are like our extended family. They provide all of our support. So people sort of wonder, like, oh, gosh, I have this project. I'm just not quite sure if I want to hand, hand it over to a foundation because then they will control it. So can you, that seems to be like a common question, um, not, not based in a lot of perhaps real world facts. So can you just kind of tear, break that apart for us? I would advise those folks probably to talk to um, contributors or owners of projects that are part of the foundation. I think that does sound scary. I think for as many times as I've seen um, all the peace, love, and JavaScript in the foundation, there's definitely been times where um, folks that own projects have um, disagreed with uh, disagreed with decisions or things that the foundation has wanted to do and that's something that they completely have the right to do and um, there's I've never seen a instance where the foundation has stepped in and said you know actually too bad because you know we are we're here now um, the projects have all their yeah that wouldn't go very well <laughs> the the projects all have their own governance so I think what I've seen is just kind of like a supportive relationship but I would encourage people to talk to folks that are part of projects existing projects um, to hear their experience because obviously um, we're biased Okay, so it can't just all be rainbows and unicorns and peace and love. So what are some of the current challenges that we are, we are facing today? Where can we do better? Well, I would say that the challenges for the OpenJS Foundations are the same challenges that, that a lot of communities faced. Like, how do we grow this community? How do we make people engage? How do we support them? Like, these type of challenges. Um, but yeah, I think in general, the OpenJS Foundation does a great job with addressing all these challenges. I think we still need to engage end users more. I think that's our, our biggest challenge is making sure that those of, uh, who are using the technology are in there giving feedback to the various projects, contributing you know, their give back essentially for all that they've taken advantage of, and you know, potentially even supporting the foundation at, at some level. Um, it takes effort. And, and money to, to keep these things going. And while we have a good base, it's, it, it's always great to have more folks come in and support and grow and, and get our message out even broader for each of the projects. Not for the foundation, but who cares what the foundation's called? It's each one of those individual projects that we want to see promoted and have the resources that they need to do what they want to do. So um, I think that's the challenge for us right now is, is really getting the end users to engage well with us and, and support us. I think the big, biggest challenge I see in the community and the industry is um, I think that um, the you see the same people contributing both at the contributor level and the governance level and um, I, the governance, the foundation governance as well as the, the um, project governance and I think seeing representation, I think uh, I mean, the biggest domination I see, it's very U.S.-based. I, I mean, I'm sure, um, you know, the, the, there's lots of people using our technologies all over the world, and we, it's a conversation that we've had at the CPC level a bunch. You know, how can we help? Can we change our meeting times to different times? You know, how do we reach out to folks? I think um, there's definitely a representation. I mean, we'll, this will never be solved, but it's definitely an ongoing problem that I think 
we, there's a lot of us putting efforts towards, and I think that's the place where I personally think um, it would be great to see some growth over the next few years. Yeah, we've had that one for a long time. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I, I think lots of work to do to bring in more underrepresented communities. Um, and so, I mean, how, how did you get involved in open source? I mean, do you have to code? Do you, I mean, I think it's, it sounds pretty intimidating, I think, for folks. So. Yeah, I was terrified. I always describe it. Um, I always looked at it earlier in my career. I looked at it like, um, you know, a coliseum of people just yelling at each other. That's what it seemed like from the outside. Um, and I got installed, uh, one of my mentors had this project um, that was open source. It was a Twitter client for Windows that I was able to get involved in. It was just kind of a baby step that grew from there. It was a neat experience. Yeah, I, I got involved through local communities. So first I started getting like, yeah, going to events, to conferences, then I became one of the leaders. And then, yeah, it just started from there. So I, I went the path that I, I recommend many people do, which is go out and get involved and chop wood and carry water. And, and that means do things even as simple as help build docks, right? Our docks are our biggest unsung heroes. So I helped a fellow in Bermuda with a uh, popular satellite tracking program uh, back in the 90s. Uh, but you know that's how I got my start, just doing the documentation and helping him get through that and doing all the testing as well, too. I became you know chief tester number one. And, in, in pulling things together, so. Um, and I always recommend that people, you know, do whatever they can to participate. Find people within the community who are leaders, help them get the tasks done that they want to get done. And they'll help you then, you know, land your patches and, and become part of the community and get much more involved. And that's your path to becoming a committer or maintainer in a project uh, with as, as much speed as you possibly can get. So. Yeah, and I will add that community is very open, so they like people to contribute, even if it's small, if you, you can do translations, if you speak another language, there is a lot of things, and the community is really open for you yeah, to and, start and, getting. And if you're, if you're a developer, do the code reviews, right? Make your comments known, uh, yeah. be part Create of that process. Issues. Yes. And if you're not a developer, there's a lot of ways to, I mean, I am not a developer, but it turns out I can write about code. So, yeah, so there's a, a lot of ways to get involved. And um, I was sort of always a policy wonk, and I find that this is a nice little balance if you like sort of diplomacy a little bit. And I think I love the working across company, across geographical boundaries. It's been pretty great. Um, and we do have lots of opportunities at OpenJS from our program committee for our conference. Uh, we've just launched a scholarship fund if you're interested in participating in that and the mentorship. We have so many ways to get involved that don't involve code. But yeah, code review, we, we'd love that too. Love that too. Um, so I think you had talked about your career. I mean, how has open source sort of, and working in the community sort of helped your career path, do you think? Jeez, I got a little too long a career, I date myself. So, you know, I, I was back at the very beginning, I had to solve uh, for a price point for a server, and, and so we found Dennis Torvald and started talking to him about Linux, and that's when IBM started making its commitments to, you know, actually support Linux as something you can use in your enterprise, and put our patent portfolio bef behind it, joined OIN, helped uh, to really foster that and make that happen. So, so I was, that's you know where I got started in this and, and how it's happened and I've you know, I've been part of uh, various other things as, as we've gone through time here. Um, it's uh, my you know I've, I've made vice president in a company right you know and That's good. Uh, yeah, it good. did okay it, you know so so being involved in these projects didn't hurt me you know not and, so much and and I was able to contribute by helping you know shape the policies inside the company and and get things out into the open and then for the last 10 years or so, really running the open source uh, activities on, on IBM across the world. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's certainly driven my career. I can't speak highly enough because you also learn to behave with people. <laughs> I guess that's the best word I can use for it, right? Go out there, be participative, value everybody's contributions, the things they have to say, listen to them, be part of the communities. And uh, I, that, that's a skill I think everybody needs. 
Yeah, open source and being involved in the communities has shaped my entire career. Um, I'm head of developer advocate at Fusebit, not an open source anymore. I get confused. Um, but, but yes, being part of this has opened the doors in so many levels, like personally and professionally. And yeah, I just, right now, I'm fully focused on developer advocacy, so creating content, creating videos, being part of communities, speaking at conferences. So yeah, it's changed my whole career. I think it's open source is, uh, I'm, um, I think open source has really uh, helped my career in the way that I'm a fine developer, right? Like I'm a, I'm a decent developer, I'm not the most amazing developer, but I think with community, I get to learn from so many different people and both be empowered by a large group of folks and help empower those individuals as well. So I think it's really uh, a force multiplier in general for the things that are important to you, which has been really neat. Great. I don't know how we're doing on time. Time check. 15 minutes. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, so one of the other things we hear, although we sometimes maybe joke about, is is kind of this open source governance boring? And we always say boring is cool. Boards are unanimous most of the time. What? <laughs> Boards are unanimous in their decisions most of the time. Yes, oh. we are boring. Boring. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, <laughs> boring. So we have some. We do have some fun. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's like a question. <laughs> you know, that is a yeah. question. Are we boring? No. no, no, I think it's really... If you tuned into our public meetings... Yeah. <laughs> I think it's great. I think um, I... Uh, no, I, I don't think... If, I, if it was boring, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, it's very hard to keep my attention. I think the... Uh, and I think, I think the thing that I've observed that's most fun is the people, getting to know the people, working with different people, like being able to come every week to CPC meetings and see Robin and Jory and whole bunch of other people and hear what's going on in their lives and understand why they get involved and um, what motivates them and that kind of thing. I think those are, I think that's the fun part. Yeah, I don't think it's boring either um, because, <laughs> because of the people that like you get to meet very cool people that are creating great things and also because the projects that are creating, like, I mean, creating Node.js or creating, I don't know, like APM, like it's so many so many great things that are being built right now. So I think, yeah, it's not boring. There's a lot of things to contribute. And um, yeah, sometimes like the meetings can get a little bit too technical and people can get lost, but, but yeah, you can always participate. And as I said before, like the community is very open and they help encourage people to participate. Yeah, no, I was just talking about the board of directors. The rest of the community is great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> great. I thought it was sometimes funny. We support the infrastructure of our, many of our projects, including jQuery. So Brian Warner is our program director. So can you imagine when he's doing a little infrastructure tweak to jQuery and he has to, he's like waiting 30 seconds for something to load and he feels like 70% of the world's websites are going to crash. But they don't. So it's really fun and exciting, right? It's definitely not boring. It gives them some gray hair. but. <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> that's about it. So um, just sort of going, circling back, you know, to the projects that really make, the found, make up the foundation. So um, how does, you know, the Cross Project Council or the, or the board decide, maybe the board doesn't decide, which projects we take on? I don't know. <laughs> we have a, we have a, we have a uh, so for the projects reached out to us, we have a pretty transparent checklist that is in our GitHub that you can take a look at. Um, just questions about um, representation, what companies are represented, it, uh, represented on your, it as part of your project. Do you have a code of conduct? Is that transparent? How do people contribute? You know, what is that process? There's just things that we think are important that are part of the projects already. And then um, as a group, we'll get together and we vote to see if, um, if it makes sense. And we think about, first of all, does it make sense for the project and does it make sense for us? Um, sometimes if projects are too small, it's too much, it, it's just creating more work for them and not a lot of value. And 
um, or you know if um, for example a project is completely owned by one company that can maybe be a conflict of interest that kind of thing so those are the things that we look at when people are joining and Todd the board really doesn't we don't do anything with that exactly and actually Liz's answer there's a little bit of truth in that as well because we have been having working sessions with our cross project council on to define our technical strategy on which projects and we always say if a project is super important to the ecosystem the community very it needs to be nurtured and cherished let's bring it in and so how do you prioritize on the proactive and reactive and again very transparently we've been working on that and we don't have all the answers yet so if you want to help us figure it out we would love to love to have you there so um, so what other questions do I want to ask um, we had sort of talked about influence like so does becoming like a member allow me to like bring in my project to the foundation does being a member allow me to influence any technology decisions or how I spend the money at OpenJS? So, mm -hmm. well, hey, you, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll let you hear them. Uh, the good thing about the foundation is not that it's just you making decisions. It's a group of people, so you can say like, oh, it, yes, let's put some money on this. It's like it's a group of people that has to make the decision, so that makes it all easier and better and more transparent. And, and from a financial perspective, we try to operate as a board in you know the way you'd want any entity to operate. So we have a finance committee who looks at what we're spending our money on, creates a budget, works with the staff to get that in place, and then um, that gives them the freedom to spend against that budget. And if there's trouble or something or some new thing they want to go spend against, we work to reprioritize and, and reset things and um, continue on. And, um, that is approved by the board, so having uh, you know, a seat on the board at the table gives you the ability to have influence on that. But we're, we're always out trying to meet the needs of the community. That's really why we rebalance and do things. So, uh, but that helps with it. Now, any other indu, undue influence in terms of getting your project in? No, nah, it doesn't matter. You can have good things that still the you know, CPC looks at and says, no, nah, we don't want that in here. So, um, and because it's, it's not a pay for play in, in that regard. It's, it's, you're there to support the overall community and, uh, and things work on their merits of, of what they've been put together with and the community behind them, not anything else. Yeah, I think, I think um, the thing that was most surprising to me about influence is how easy it was to get involved. I encourage anyone who's at all even a little bit interested to join a CPC meeting. They're on every Tuesday, uh, varying times depending on your time zone. Anyone can show up. Um, anyone can become a part of the CPC. Um, and anyone can be part of that discussion. So I think the influence is really up to the individual and the way that it kind of is similar to your day job, you know, like your, your influence is equals um, the amount of work that you're willing to put into it, the um, folks that you're connected to, that kind of thing. I think that um, the CPC is just a really easy way for anyone to show up and have opinions and be heard and work with people. So I think the influence part was really surprising to me because I, I was expecting, okay, I'm going to have to sit in these meetings for a year and then maybe I can talk about things, but no. I think everyone's welcome, all opinions are welcome, and it's, it's always helpful to have more hands. Right, and the interesting thing, the way the Cross Project Council is structured, we have um, our large projects have representatives with voting rights, but if you want to just be anybody, you can just come and participate, and if you show up for any length of time, you can be a voting member as well. So um, again, it's completely open. If you go to our openjsf.org website, you can go to our collaboration page, and there's a public calendar, so you can add them all onto your calendar for reminders. Um, there's a Slack invite, so all of those uh, are right out there. So, I think we have one question. Do we have time for a question? I was just going to open for questions. Yeah. So great, fantastic. Here, let me um, run with the mic. Really? Oh, yeah. Cool. So I think we were saying before that um, you know. Uh, developers aren't salespeople, probably true. I think um, Liz said earlier, the doers should be in charge or should be in governance positions. So people actually in the community should be making the decisions. And Todd, you were saying the biggest challenge is end user engagement. 
I think this all wraps up into one interesting problem, which as, is as, uh, you know, open source projects often start as duocracies, like the people get together around a problem they want to solve, but as larger companies get involved, who can offer many more resources, um, but come with processes, that kind of ability to crystallize the vision and bring new people into the project becomes harder. Have you kind of seen be best practice around forming future vision uh, in, for kind of innovation or priorities for a project as it scales? So as, as kind of large organizations become involved, having a, a vision for the future that attracts more people and engages end users and allows other companies to offer their resources as well? So, you know, the, the one that strikes me the most is Kubernetes, right? What happened there to incent people to want to continue to come in and participate? Because it, it, it scaled to something huge, right? You know, thousands of participants making um, sometimes just a single um, you know, commit sometimes many, many. Usually in, in, in projects of thousands of people, you'll find that, you know, there's a hundred people who make, or ten people even, who make most of the work happen and then lots of other things that, that come in behind it. Um, I think the, the formula that um, I've seen work best has, has been, as, as we've set up organizations, tried to do the three-legged three stool approach, right, where we have um, the backing that comes from the supporters, uh, the company side of it, them able to put their resources into the projects, but a technical oversight committee who's essentially watching what's going on with the projects and making sure that we pick the right things to go and do, and then end users giving us feedback immediately into the process to help shape the direction of where things are going so that that backlog that's developing that you're trying to go and, you know, get into uh, upstream is, is shaped by what the end users say they really want. Um, and that, that gives you that, that future sort of vision without it just being a big push of technology from the various company members trying to go push it. You have, you have a backdrop of real user experience who's saying, no, we need this. And, and I think that's what really helped them grow and do the things that they were, they were looking at doing. Great, so I've learned on the health and safety protocols, I shouldn't be passing the mic, but I'm happy to repeat questions. That would have been a hard one to remember. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ask it loudly and then I'll repeat it for the online folks, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you pursue transparency in communication, uh, particularly at the, the higher levels where um, some of the more influential conversations occur? Um, That's a great question. How do you, in, how do you, um, encourage transparency and communication or break into that, particularly at the higher levels where decisions are being made. Yeah. Yeah, I will say that to have a very clear code of conduct is very important. And also having a channel of communication that allows you to be transparent. Like if it's Zoom or if it's GitHub, it's like, so everything is already there. Like, yeah. And, and having people um, call out folks, or. or just do everything publicly, I guess, right, is the, the hard part there. There's some spammer on it. Um, but, but basically, when you see a discussion that should be going on out in the public and it's, it's for some reason happening in just a private, small, little set of folks, you say, no, stop, we need to go and get this out into whatever communication method you're doing. Uh, I think that's what's so key. Yeah, also another thing is like everything, for example, in the OpenJS Foundation, all the meetings are being recorded and also published on YouTube, so it's public. Everything, you can see all the meetings from the past, and so it makes it easier to be transparent when everything is public, as Todd said. Yeah, those two. I think the YouTube <laughs> is a big one. Yeah, yeah, and, and flagging it when they should be public. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, I've gone on YouTube and looked at, you know, for example, Node.js, you know, build meetings or release meetings and, you know, so then I kind of get a sense of what they're talking about and then sometimes you can just join and be what we call lurkers and that's super cool too. Um, you can speak up if you feel like it. If not, you are always welcome. Again, I think we heard from GitHub this morning, we want all key hands on keyboard, right? So, all hands on keyboard. So, um, I think we have like a minute left. Um, I just want to thank everybody. I don't know if you have any sort of closing thoughts that you'd like to share? 
No, just thank you, and thank yeah. you for everything that you know yourselves and the foundation does to support us, as well as the Linux Foundation does. It's it's great to be part of this, and we're doing something for the world and and for our companies as well too, as we participate. Yeah, I just also want to say thank you, and thank you to all of you to be here. And also um, an invitation for all of you, if you want to join any type of communities or the foundation, is always open. Yeah, Cross Project Council, every Tuesdays, the Google Calendar is online. Yeah, Tuesdays are my favorite days. So yeah, if you want Tuesdays to be your favorite day, then come hang out with us. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.